Look with me tonight at Matthew chapter 16. We will not be here long, but in keeping with what we talked about this morning, one of the things I think that is important when we talk about contentment is that we understand who Jesus Christ is. And so in Matthew chapter 16, a very interesting um, conversation takes place. And as you're turning there, we're going to be looking at verse 13 and following. It's interesting that in this conversation, that's shortly after that, um, that the very one who makes the greatest statement about who Christ is, is the very one that Jesus has to say, get thee behind me, Satan. So it's interesting how these relationships work out, but... In keeping with contentment and loving what we're supposed to be loving and understanding how this all fits together, Jesus asks his disciples a very a couple of interesting questions. I'd like to just take a look at them, if I could, for just a moment. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? You know, it's interesting as I think about that question, who do men say that Jesus Christ is today? Think about that for just a minute. Some say that uh, he's God's son. Some say that he is a good teacher, a good man, a good prophet, someone who knew scripture, a good Jew. And all of those things are truisms, but they are not the fullness of who he is. In other words, the world can define Jesus however they choose to. And if I could take just a moment to speak about that defining, what the world sees of Jesus ought to be reflected from us. Uh, the, The sad part about it is the world usually defines the role of Jesus by what they see us doing. If we're not loving, they see that. If we're not caring, they see that. And it's a hypocrisy for us to say out of uh, one side of our mouth or saying, oh, how I love Jesus, and then go and live in the world as if it doesn't really matter. So when he asks this question, he's asking a very open question, and he's asking it uh, for them to try and identify it. For them to kind of get a grasp of it. And you know, I think it's a a good thing for us every once in a while to look around those who are in our peer groups, those who we deal with, and ask the question, who do they say that he is? And then look at that and look for ways to minister to them so that they see him for all he really is. And if you notice in verse 14, uh, they said, Some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. You see, they were divining them probably the same way people in our world today would, only they knew some of these a little bit better. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. We know that uh, in the course of it, while everything was still going good in in, uh, Judah and in Jerusalem, Um, there was a a judgment that was coming. In fact, uh, Josiah, as he was doing all the reforms and everything like that for the children of Israel uh, in Jerusalem, and they had found that extra scroll uh, that Hilkiah had come across, and he was trying to make those reforms. It was taken, the, the, the scrolls were taken to a prophetess, and she basically said, Josiah, because you're doing these things and you've acknowledged that this is the law of God, first of all, I want you to know God is going to fulfill everything that he said in that scroll. In other words, judgment is coming. But because you have been faithful to him, you will die and go to your grave and not have to go through the judgment and the turmoil. But the interesting part about it was that Jeremiah was there even while everybody was saying it was everything is going good. Jeremiah was saying, no, it's not. Judgment is coming. Josiah knew it. Jeremiah knew it. And when Jesus asked his disciples of these things, Jeremiah was known as a very valid prophet because everything that he said came to fruition, including the 70 years that they would spend in captivity. So Elijah, as well, was taken up. And and so he's another anomaly that's there. We know that Jeremiah was killed in Egypt, but with Elijah, he was taken up and just wasn't seen anymore. So maybe, maybe that's who you are. 
It's interesting because as they were saying these, these were all things that people would have known in that day and would have been satisfied to say, this is who I think it is. And the problem with it is in our world today, too many people are trying to identify Jesus and trying to put a label on him that is contrary to the one that he has placed and taken upon himself as the Son of God. So, who does the world say that he is? A good question to ask ourselves as we're out ministering in our peer groups. Who do they say that he is? And why would they say, or what would they say about how we are portraying him? He said to them in verse 15, But who do you say that I am? It does matter what you think about Jesus. I've heard Christians that have been Christians for years, and I've heard some of those very things that I spoke of a minute ago from the world, a good prophet, a good teacher, uh, you know, the Son of God, uh, but they don't see him as a part of salvation. They just see him as God's Son, and they don't see him in the role as Savior. It's important for you to be able to identify. If somebody said, who is Jesus? What would your response be? How would you respond to that question. It's a valid question for Jesus to ask his disciples. It's a valid question for us to be asked today. Who do you say that he is? That's a pretty, pretty interesting question, isn't it? Well, let's take a look at some of the things that Jesus said about himself to help us understand before we go further into this and what Simon Peter had to say. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, he says, the thief and the robber comes in that they may kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So he's come for us and for us to understand that aspect of it. Also in John 3.17, look with me at that for just a moment. A lot of people are able to quote John um, 3.16, but how many people know what 17 says? John 3.17 says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Right after we heard, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It goes on to say, it says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. It's interesting because Jesus didn't need to come in and judge the world. Isn't that interesting? Jesus didn't need to come and judge all the things that were going on in the world and say, Oh my goodness, I'm judging this and judging... The reality of it is, anyone in sin has already been judged. It wasn't that Jesus had to come and say, Here's what you're doing, all the things you're doing wrong. They were already condemned by the law. Nobody could do all of those things, but Jesus didn't come so that, uh, so that he could bring condemnation in. He came because they were condemned already. He came so that they might have life. He came so that they could have salvation. Isn't it great when you start looking at what, what Jesus says about himself and the things that are important? In John fourteen six. He tells his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way. And where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. As he's asking these questions of his disciples and saying, who do you say that I am? Do you think that they're grasping the depth and the scope of all of these things at this particular point? I've come so that you have, may, may have life and have it more abundantly. I didn't come to condemn you. I came to save you. I'm the only way that you can get to the Father. And that takes us back to what Peter has to say. All the way back in Matthew 16. Let's go back there for just a minute. In Matthew chapter 16, he says, Peter says this. In verse 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Let me ask you, what are the things that God's revealed to you about himself? What are the things that you know about Jesus because they've been revealed to you through your studies? It's interesting because those things that are revealed to us, those are the things that help us identify when that question comes to our mind, who do I say that he is? It's interesting because this question that he's asked them can be a question we ask of ourselves more often than not. Think with me for just a minute. When things are going bad, who do you say that he is? When you're going through difficult times, who do you say that he is? When things aren't going well at your work, who do you say he is? When you've had a death in the family, who do you say that he is? You see, the reality of it is, that's a question that we can ask just about at every turn of our life. And how we answer that question demonstrates to the world as well as resolves in our own heart that he is someone we can trust and believe in. This is why it was so important for the disciples to get this and to understand it. And what Simon Peter had to say, I don't think was in the fullness of understanding. As many of us, we have a greater understanding today because we see the whole picture. You see, at this time, Jesus hadn't already died. So for Peter to say these things, it was a big thing. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't show that to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. In other words, there's things that God wants to reveal to us about himself and about his Son. And it's an ongoing process. It's not that once we accepted Christ, we know everything that there is about him. It's that as we grow and we learn more, he teaches us even more. So that our answer can change. Who do you say that he is? And as you become more dependent upon him in the difficulties of life and you watch him as he unfolds himself before you and shows you these beautiful truths that transcend through his word and we come to those places, we're able better to speak about who he is. Simon Peter didn't have all the information yet. That's why it had to be revealed to him by the Father. But for us today who have all of the wealth of things that are before us, who do we say that he is in those difficult times? Who do we say he is in those times of growth? And those times where we need some answers and we need to be moving forward in our faith. Do we believe he's the one that can propel us through that? When Simon Peter answers this, he was probably feeling pretty smug about himself. He probably was. I got it right. Knowing Simon Peter, he was kind of the mouth of the group. And, and Jesus didn't even give him the credit on that, but, but he says, my father revealed that to you, Peter. And then, based on that, he builds on that and gives us a, a, an even bigger picture. And he says in verse 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, a small stone. A small stone. But upon the truth that you just said, upon this rock, I will build my church. This isn't to say that Peter is the big rock. In fact, there's a play on words here uh, with regard to small stone and big stone. Petra being the larger, Petros being the smaller. When he said Peter, he was saying Petros, the small stone, but upon this large stone upon the truth of what you've just spoken, upon what God just gave you, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I could spend the rest of the night preaching on just that little part of it. And the gates of hell or Hades will not overpower it. Some, some think that it's a fortress type thing. Uh, some think that we need to be moving forward. There's all sorts of things that we can do, be doing, but the reality of it is there's no power that can stand against the greatness of who Jesus Christ is. No power on this earth. Even those powers that we don't understand. In verse 19, there are some who have difficulty with that because what exactly does it mean? I'm going to give you the king, the keys of the kingdom. 
The best way that I've been able to explain it and understand it for myself is the resources of all that God has have been made available. God's resources are there. If you remember from the message this morning, I will never leave you or forsake you, but the resources of God are at our disposal, not for our purposes, but for the kingdom purposes. The keys weren't so that they could, they could lock and unlock those things. The keys were there so that they could do the ministry that was set before them. And it goes on in that second part of it. It says, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, it's contingent upon some things, not their decisions to say, God, I like this, let's like this today. It's that the agreement of what they're doing is in agreement with what's going on in heaven. They're not going to be doing anything that was disapproved of in heaven. And what they bound here, it ought to have been bound because it was bound in heaven. And where people say, no, 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 they have the choices to make, that would be to acquiesce the position of God away and say, here's the keys. You know, it's interesting, if you have a key to this church, you have some responsibility for that key, do you not? If you're not supposed to be in the church, are you supposed to be using your keys? If you're supposed to be here, are you supposed to be using your keys? Yeah, it's understood. You're supposed to be here. If you're not supposed to be here, and you just decided, well, I I think I'll just go up to the church, and I don't care what anybody says. I'm going to turn on all the air conditioner and all the lights and sit there and read my book. Well, you know, we're in agreement about the use of those keys, and those keys are to be used for the facilitating of the things that God wants done. Those keys to the kingdom that were given to, to, the, to, to Peter and the disciples, as it's spoken of here, are keys that are keys that work universally, but they also react universally. They're not going to be doing anything that they shouldn't be doing with those keys. And it's interesting because Scripture tells us all of the things that they're supposed to be doing. It tells us all the things we're supposed to be doing. This is why when it says, ask anything according to my purpose, and I'll give it. Do you not think that that's the form of keys as well? But notice what the key, uh, the, the important part of that key is. That it's for the purpose of what? The kingdom work. It doesn't say ask anything that you want, and just because you want it, you get it. Ask it according to the purposes. And what he was saying is the truth that was just spoken and the foundation this was built upon, these keys would unlock the things here as well as there. But it's not like they were locked because they weren't ever done in heaven. Those keys were designed to show that the power of heaven has become a resource to the apostles to do the things of heaven here on earth. It's interesting because as we look at that and consider that, he warns his disciples in the next verse, when he came, when, then when he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. And why was that? Because his time wasn't fulfilled yet. It wasn't time for him to be uh, put before the people and, and, and all of the things to take place. This is one of the reasons why we see him up in the Sea of Galilee a lot. If you were down in Jerusalem, there was already a move on to kill him. In fact, when he started to go back to Jerusalem and told his disciples right before the time of his death, he told his disciples, I need to go back. Guess what? They said, don't you know they're trying to kill you back there? Don't go there. So he tells them, he says, be careful with what I've just told you. Now it's interesting because as we talk to the world and we have our understanding about the things of God and about Jesus Christ, is the world going to accept everything that we have to say about Jesus Christ from the perspective as we understand it? We need to know that the world sees him differently. But even in the midst of them seeing him differently, we should be doing those things to help them to see him in the light of of what He's doing through us. What His Spirit is doing in our lives. What He's transforming us out of and creating us into. In verse 21, it says, From that time on, or from that time, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem 
As I shared with you a moment ago, they didn't have the fullness of understanding of this. And we see the truth of all of this in just a moment as Peter makes some statements. And and he says he's beginning to tell them and show them about himself. And you know, the more you study about Jesus Christ, the more you'll know about him because he'll reveal that to you in beautiful ways. And he tells them that I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter, you just got to love him. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, the same one who pronounced thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He turns and says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. So as we come to the the close of this study tonight, a couple of things that have transformed or have taken place in here. First of all, we see that the world is going to have uh, an understanding of who Jesus Christ is. We as Christians have an understanding of who He is based on what He's taught us, based on what He's told us, based on the things of Scripture. We see that in the process of this, we see that that the foundation is not built upon Peter, but is built upon the truth that Christ is the Son of the living God. We see also that the keys that were given to the kingdom are resources that were given to them and are given to us today so that people can better understand who He is and to show us how we should live We knew that Jesus was going to have to die, but I I brought in this passage starting in verse 22 because Peter is the one who says all of these things that, way to go, kudos to you, but in the very next few verses, he's now being declared and told, Satan, get behind me. So he's gone from uh, the highest form of praise and he's gone to the lowest, and that's because he didn't understand the fullness. You know, it's interesting. I think about this often when I'm out in the world and, and in my past and my life. I look at the things that I've done and I realize that there's been times I've sang the praise of, of God and, and, and I've spoken of the greatness of who He is. But then with just a short time, I then am doing the same thing that Peter did here. With my praise and my knowledge of who He is and then I turn around and in my actions... I show him to be something else or I deny the very thing that I've just spoken. I don't know about you, but when those times come in your life, I hope that you'll be reminded that Peter was redeemed back, that he was restored back. But it's so easy to fall from being able to say everything we need to about Christ and then turn around and then miss so completely the very things that God is doing. I hope tonight that as we've looked at these things, that it would help you as you look at the contentment in your life, as you look at how you're serving the Lord every day, and understand that as quickly as this took place in just these few verses, it can happen to us. This is why it's so important to be content in the Lord, knowing I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing every day of my life, and being content in those things knowing who He is and knowing how quickly that I can stumble and become a stumbling block to others. So, I leave you with that tonight and I hope and pray that God would use this in a very special way. And I hope this week you would go out and use the resources that God has given to each of us to use to His honor and His glory as you walk contently with Him. Would you stand with me?